welcome you this evening to this important event, and I want to extend my gratitude to Professor Allen for being with us. I'm sorry it's so cold. Um, but we might be warmer than Boston, so maybe it's a little bit better. But a little bit. A little we are grateful warmer. for you being with us here tonight. Tonight has a couple of things. First, we have the opportunity to hear from a thought leader and someone who is doing great work to talk about the unity we need to build in our country. But we also get to celebrate the first lecture series of our Lincoln Scholar Program. And for those of you who don't know about the Lincoln Scholar Program, it's truly the vision and leadership of Professor Tom Merrill that brought this to SPA. And it was his insight that through reading challenging books, students could come together and grow both their hearts and their minds and challenge each other and move forward in conversation. And this program has been very popular among our students and something that we are very proud to have in the school and I know will be um, a great place for discourse going forward uh, throughout time. So I welcome him up here to do the introduction and I also thank him for his leadership on this and for planning this event. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Wilkins. Um, I need to start uh, my comments tonight with some thank yous. Um, I need to first thank everyone here for coming, uh, especially on this cold night when maybe you're preoccupied with impeachment business. Uh, but we're grateful that you're here spending this time with us. Um, I need to thank Dean Wilkins, um, who has been a big supporter of Lincoln Scholars and indeed um, uh, the key fact to allowing this program to get off the ground uh, this first year. Um, I think one thing that needs to be said by Dee Wilkins is that unlike many other political scientists, she is a citizen and she cares about the common good and that she's willing to uh, push hard to uh, build the things that she thinks need to be built. So um, thank you to her for that. I also need to say thanks to my colleagues in the Political Theory Institute. Um, it wasn't just me that came up with this despite what Dee Wilkins said. Um, I need to thank Alan Levine, the director of the uh, Political Theory Institute, Gordon Flanagan, uh, my colleague who teaches ancient political philosophy, Sarah Hauser, and Jeremy J. Now, who all have advised and really helped me think through what this we're coming to. Finally, I need to recognize another group of people, um, I think most of whom are here tonight, some of them are not, shame on them, but, uh, and who have been important in getting the program off the ground uh, this fall. These are the students in my two seminars, uh, my two freshman seminars um, this fall. I don't think that when they signed up for the class that they knew what they were getting into. Uh, how could they? But they've been cheerfully talking about hard topics, reading hard books, arguing with each other, arguing with me, getting their papers in on time, most of the time. Um, they're funny and they're smart, and I want to tell them that it's been a pleasure and a privilege for me to spend this time with them. So it's important to have this here. Just for the record, uh, so you can get a sense of what we've been up to, I want to mention some of the topics that we've been talking about in class. Uh, there are four. Death. In his autobiography, Frederick Douglass told the story about the, his confrontation with Covey the slave breaker, a confrontation in which Douglass could easily have been killed. Now, death is a scary thing for a human being, maybe the scariest thing for a human being. But Douglass makes us ask, do we have to face up to our fear of death in order to be truly free? What makes it possible for a human being to look death in the face and still do the thing that they believe in? Number two, sex. We read in class Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. She talks a lot about sex, which as we know is messy physically and emotionally. She argues that the root of sexism in human beings is our fear of that messiness, especially the messiness and weirdness of pregnancy. Uh, and we ask, is she right? Number three, God. We read Karl Marx, who argues that human beings will never be truly free so long, uh, unless they overcome their attachments to religion. But we also read Martin Luther King, who called upon the United States to live up to its original promise of equality and freedom for all. Religion, I think, is an essential part of King's argument and the grounding for his case for freedom. And so we ask, who is right, Marx or King? Finally, number four, freedom. We read the Declaration of Independence together. How could we not as Americans? But we had to wrestle with questions like, how do we square the noble words of the Declaration with the historical reality of race-based justice in American history? 
Is it still possible to believe in the teaching of the Declaration in the light of that history? How would we think differently or act differently today if we did really believe in the words of the Declaration? In our classes, we haven't come to any agreement about those questions, and nor, will, nor will we, I suspect. But we share a sense that wrestling with those questions and others is a task for each of us. No one can do the work of thinking them through except for, uh, for each of us. But at the same time, we can't do it by ourselves. We need smart people to talk these issues through, to challenge us, to argue with us. And the thing that we've done in class is that we sit together at the table, we look each other face in the face, and we try to make arguments, the best arguments that we can, about these things that are most difficult to talk about. When we were thinking of possible speakers for this first Lincoln Scholars Lecture, uh, the, the committee of people who were talking about this, uh, we all agreed that there wasn't anyone who would be better for what we were looking for than Daniel Allen. Professor Allen is the James Bryan Conant University Professor at Harvard University and the director of Harvard's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. She's the author of five books and co-editor of two others. Her main topics uh, of interest are justice and citizenship, both in ancient Athens and in contemporary America. Uh, she's written many books. Uh, one of her books that I'll mention, Cause American Tragedy, a memoir about a family member who was incarcerated. She also writes regularly for the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and other outlets. Tonight, she's going to talk about, uh, give a lecture based on one of her books, which is up here, Our Declaration, Reading the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. She says a lot of interesting things in the book. The main reason that we wanted her to talk about this, in addition to the fact that it's important to talk about the book is really a model of how to read a text carefully by arguing with it, by trying to think through, is it true? What would it mean if, if it's true? How does the text work as a text? And so we really wanted to have someone to speak to that discipline of reading closely and wrestling with books that we're not sure if they're right or not. So um, without further ado, I'd just like to ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Allen, and we're very glad that she's here. So, Good evening. I know it's cold, but you guys can do better than that. Good evening. Good to see you. So I want to say thank you to Dean Wilkins. Where'd she go? Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Professor Merrill, for your leadership in building a new curriculum and a new program here at American University, and for inviting me to participate in a conversation with you and your students. It's a pleasure to be here. It's funny for me to be here, too, because I don't actually come to DC very often. So I think about American democracy all the time. I write about American democracy all the time. I write for the Washington Post, but I almost never come to Washington, DC. So when I go other places, I always like to ask people, so how many of you would say that you've thought about politics at least once in the last month? So I guess that's all of you, okay? Then, then I get, and how many of you think that you've thought about politics in, at least once in the last week? And how many of you have thought about politics every day for the last period of time? Let's see a show of hands. Where are we on that one? Okay. Now I'm, I'm curious. Here's where I want to know if you guys are the same as the rest of America or different from the rest of America. How many of you think we are living in a moment of crisis? All right, you're different from the rest of America. Every hand goes up everywhere else, okay, on that question. So I just want you to know that about yourselves. So that's interesting. I don't know if that, should I take hope from that? Or should I be alarmed? Yeah, we'll figure that one out. But everywhere else I go, if I say, do you feel it living in a moment of crisis, every hand goes up. So that is the context that I want to start from. And then the question is, how on earth can the Declaration of Independence, written nearly 250 years ago, authored, we most commonly think, by Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner, how can this text be of any help to us now? That's the question. How can it be of any help in a moment of crisis? Now, you guys aren't totally sure there's a crisis going on. There's a crisis going on, okay? Nonetheless, the question pertains. Even if you don't quite think it's a crisis, still there's the question of can the Declaration be of any help? And I want to make the case that it can be. You knew I was going to make that case. 
So the interesting question will be how I make the case that the declaration can be of real value and should be a resource that we turn to now in the present as we try to think our way through the political questions confronting us. The first thing I want to say about this is just actually a point that's more generally about democracy and what democratic citizens need in order to build and maintain healthy and thriving constitutional democracies. So if you ask somebody, if a, if a kid comes up and asks you to explain what a monarchy is, it's very easy to answer that question because you just sort of go find a picture of Queen Elizabeth and you say, that person is in charge. I mean, obviously that's not exactly accurate at this point in time with British constitutional monarchy. Nonetheless, they get the basic concept that there's a person who can establish a set of rules for a polity, power is centralized, and that is sort of the end of the story about what is entailed in politics. Now, if a kid asks, what's democracy? It's a much harder question to answer. There's no picture you can point to to say, well, that, that's who's in charge. There's not actually a picture because the word democracy means the power of the people. Demos being the ordinary people, kratos coming from the Greek word for power related to the word for hand and grasping and control. So how do you have a picture of the people who is in charge in a democracy? The very concept of democracy requires abstraction from the get-go, all right? And that makes democracy a pretty distinctive kind of political form, different from a monarchy, any kind of autocratic government, uh, different from an oligarchy where you have sort of rule by the few. And the fact that democracy demands abstraction, just even to understand what it might possibly be, means that democracies require citizens to think. All right? First and most important point about democracies. Democracies require thought on the part of their citizens. And so in a moment of crisis, I think it's really important to underscore the value of thinking. And that's one of the beauties of being able to participate in your program um, here as the inaugural lecturer for the Lincoln Scholars program, the notion that you're building a curriculum with the purpose of which is to rebuild capacity for reflection, spaces for reflection, not the sort of quick back and forth of can I beat this person now in this immediate argument, but how do we actually think about an argument that can justify a, a case we'll make to others about the direction we should collectively go. The Declaration of Independence is an excellent model of that kind of thinking, and that's one of its first values to us in a moment of crisis. But beyond that, it provides the most succinct account of what democracy is that I know, and can, I believe, offer a world of education just in its words about what the fundamental job of a citizen in a democracy is. So I know several of you in the audience have read my book and have spent time with the words in the Declaration, so I'm gonna make you do it one more time. We're gonna spend some time doing some close reading together um, as a part of this. But I also want to acknowledge, as I do, that lots of people are skeptical about the value of the Declaration, and they're skeptical about it, as I said again, because of questions around slavery and questions around gender and things like that. And I'm going to come back to those questions, but I'm going to ask you to just to put them aside for a moment. I know you have them, um, and I will address them, but I want to start by just thinking about what it is that the text actually offers us by way of a vision of what it is we're trying to do together. So I like to spend time with the second sentence, which many of you know. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, driving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now be honest, how many of you remember the sentence was this long? I know those of you in Professor Merrill's class know that. Exactly. We forget that the sentence is this long. We tend to stop reading after pursuit of happiness, where all we've gotten by that point is a story about individual rights. 
But this is a beautiful philosophical argument that starts with the premise that people have rights. Second premise, governments are instituted to secure those rights. Conclusion, if governments aren't doing the job of securing those rights, it's the right of the people to change them. That last clause is the most important part of the sentence. So never may you read this sentence again and not read all the way to the end. And I do have a homework assignment for you, which is I want you to memorize this sentence. Because I believe that if you carry this sentence around with you and meditate on it over time, you will acquire a much deeper understanding of what your job is as a citizen in this democracy. So let me dig into some of that right now and some of what it shows us, um, things that are of value even to us immediately now. Um, so really important is um, the very end. This is the piece that sums up what it means to dem be a democratic citizen. We have the job of diagnosing our world, assessing whether our government is securing our rights or is destructive of that end. So diagnosis is the first job of citizenship. And if we do think the government is not securing our rights, then we have a two-part job as we think about alterations. We have to lay the foundation on principle and organize the powers of government. What does this mean exactly? In the phrase, lay the foundation on such principles, they're actually pointing back to the top part of the sentence where they're articulating a vision about basic rights that are empowering to human beings. These basic rights in their argument are what people need in order to act on that element of human equality that we all share, a basic capacity for agency, to chart a course in life, to pursue making tomorrow better than yesterday, better than today, all right? So those principles about what the rights are is something that we have to debate, discuss, try to come to some shared understanding of. Shared values, this is actually one of the jobs of being a citizen is to work on this with your fellow citizens. This doesn't mean we all have to have the same set of values, to the contrary. I am going to chart my own course towards happiness and it will be different from how you chart your course. You'll have a list of personal values and commitments that direct you and give purpose to your life. But on that list, there should be some principles that connect to the project of democracy. Think of the project of democracy as depending on liberty, equality, liberty and justice for all, freedom, fairness. These are a set of principles that should be somewhere in your value set, maybe different meanings for you for freedom than for me, but we can put those together on the table and begin to talk about them with each other and explain how does my commitment to freedom relate to my other personal commitments to beauty and faith and truthfulness and integrity. I can tell you that story about how my personal values connect to my shared values. And if we can have that conversation about shared values, we are doing the work of laying the foundation on principle. The sentence itself tells us, think. Think for yourselves. Don't take the answers from us. It tells us that in a few places. It tells us that right at the beginning when it says, we've been endowed with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Have you guys noticed that before? Among these, that means it's not a complete list, it's just some examples, all right? So it's just some examples, that's an invitation to figure out what else goes on that list. Does health go on that list, for example? That's one of the things we're debating in this country right now. What are the basic rights that we ought to be protecting for one another? The work's not done, they just made their stab at it, and say, hey, here's some examples, here's a basic structure for thinking about the core principles democracies might share in order to build a structure that empowers everybody in them. So the second way it shows us that there's a, a call, an invitation to thought is again the last clause. It says, whenever, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends. It doesn't say, well, King George became destructive and that's the end of the story. It says that later in the declaration, but here it says, whenever. It is an open-ended invitation to democratic citizens, one generation after the next, to think for themselves. All right, so I have focused on one part of the thinking for yourself, the part that's about the foundation of principle. But what about the part that's about organizing the powers of government? All right, what does that mean? It's very, very straightforward. 
this is a to-do list, and I mean that quite literally. So when Richard Henry Lee stood up in Philadelphia in Continental Congress in June of 1776 to put a resolution in front of Congress to declare independence for Britain, Congress decided they weren't ready to vote. Okay? They put it off. They punted for a month. They said, we'll schedule that vote for July. They had a really good reason for punting in that they wanted to have unanimity for this vote. It was so important. They were establishing the basis for a new polity, a new set of political institutions. Nothing less than unanimity would suffice, was their view. All right? Sounds like message to Brexit. Don't use a majority vote for a constitutional decision. Okay? Supermajority or, in this case, unanimity. Right? That's the point. In other words, they knew they were fundamentally restructuring society. They were going to set the bar at unanimity for this decision. So they put the vote off until July. But in the meanwhile, they set up three committees all right, to get ready for the moment when they would be ready to vote on this resolution for independence. The first committee was the one we're sort of here talking about. It was the committee to draft the statement of principle. It's come to be known as the Declaration of Independence. Happened that Thomas Jefferson got elected to be chair of that committee, but there were five people on it, so not just Jefferson, but John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston. It was a committee project. That was the first committee they set up. The other two committees were given the job of organizing the powers of government. What did that mean? One committee was charged with drafting the Articles of Confederation, and then the third committee was charged with setting up treaties or drafting treaties with France and Spain. All right? So this is literally a to-do list for what they thought they had to do in June of 1776 as they were going about the work of setting up a new nation. Lay the foundation on principle and organize the powers of government. So I've started to talk a little bit about how we can collectively do the work of laying a new foundation on principle, having conversations about our shared democratic values and how they connect to our individual sets of personal values. But what about organizing the powers of government? What does that actually mean? So that is just all the stuff of our political institutions and the question of whether or not they operate in such a way as to deliver safety and happiness for us. Now, this is where I get back to the crisis part of the conversation. This is one of these things I find sort of, you know, darkly funny that Americans have like a really good capacity to kind of like blind themselves to the fact of a kind of slowly creeping crisis. So it's not exactly that just like right now is a moment of crisis for us. All you have to do is think about the fact that I, honestly, I've forgotten the year whether it's 2010 or 2011, one political scientist will correct me, but register the fact that Congress had an approval rating of 9% in 2010 or 2011. And it's come back up to 20%. But Congress is the first branch. It's not co-equal. Okay, despite what everybody's saying right now, the kind of co-equal branches, no. The legislature in any democratic republic is the first branch. It is the branch with responsibility for articulating the will of the people. The executive branch has the job of executing the will of the people. It's second, because you can't have any action until you have a will of the people, which is the job of the legislator to render. All right, did you all follow that? Okay, Congress is the first branch. You cannot have a polity of self-government for free and equal citizens if you do not have a functional legislature. 9% approval, 20% approval. We will all have varying opinions of how well they're doing at this particular moment in time. I'm putting that aside. I'm looking at this in the larger picture of things where our respect for Congress has plummeted precipitously. We really have to dig into the question of why it is that our national legislature is not delivering in a way that the a people, we the people, register with a sense of approval. And if we really don't approve of Congress, if it really is at 9% or 20%, we really ought to do the work of rethinking how we organize the powers of government. But that's on us, not actually on Congress. That's on the people whose right it is to lay the foundation on principle and organize the powers of government. Okay, so the Declaration helps us right from the get-go by giving us a really crystal clear picture of what our responsibilities as citizens are. And it is this combination of laying the foundation on principle 
and thinking about how to organize the powers of government, government to deliver our safety and happiness together. All right. The Declaration also gives us a few other resources that are relevant to this present moment. And I want to share them um, before turning to the question of slavery um, and the question of gender. So this sentence, in addition to providing this crystalline and concise account of what democratic citizenship requires, also shows us important moments of compromise, right? So the sentence is elegantly constructed. It moves from individual rights that include life, liberty, and the individual pursuit of happiness to the notion that we together build a government, organize its powers, in a way that delivers our safety and happiness. In other words, the sentence moves from I to we, from what I individually do to think through what will be good for me, to my effort to put that together with everybody else to de develop a collective vision of where we should be collectively steering our polity. And how do we ever get from I to we? This is the hardest problem of democratic life. How do we convert the multitude of different preferences and interests and commitments and aspirations into something that we can collectively hold on to? A part of the answer is just process, that it has to involve conversation, it has to involve listening, hearing other people. But another part of the point and the argument is that it has to involve compromise. This is the piece I want to spend some time on, um, spend more time on. Because we are in a world where I think many of us have come to think that the only good compromise is no compromise. And there's good reason for us to come to think this in the sense that as we learn about our own history, there's one compromise which is front and center in how we think about compromise. And that is, of course, the great compromise that secured enslavement in this country for decades. Right? So the regrettable thing is that a democracy requires compromise to function. Okay? But our most powerful and compelling example of compromise is the compromise over slavery. So how do we get ourselves out of that bind? How can we see our way to appreciating the value of compromise, but being able to see a difference between good compromises and bad compromises? That's the problem that we currently face. So there are two compromises in the Declaration, and I want to tell you about both of them, because I think one is a good compromise and one was a bad compromise. And I think homing in on the differences between these two compromises can help us reacquire a distinction between good and bad compromise that might make it possible for us to reimagine where compromise might fit into our own political lives and political world. So what's the good compromise? The good compromise shows up in this passage in the word creator. Right? Jefferson did not write creator. Okay? I mentioned this was a committee process, committee writing. Benjamin and Franklin made significant edits, and creator came in from one of them. In fact, as an aside, I can say, you know, one of the really important lessons that Thomas Jefferson teaches us is how to get credit for something, okay? <laughs> because why do we all think that Thomas Jefferson is the Declaration, or the one and only author of the Declaration? You know it, because you guys live here, so you know you've been to, you know, you, you know what's on his tombstone, right? Author, Declaration of Independence. So that's the secret. If you want credit for something, Put it on your tombstone, and forever people will absolutely credit you with that. Jefferson was one of five. John Adams was the intellectual architect of the Declaration, which we can see from things that he wrote January through April of 1776. Um, I'll come back to more about Adams because he's also responsible for the language of happiness in this Declaration. But the compromising went all the way through, and when Jefferson wrote his first draft, there was not much language for religion in the draft at all. He didn't use creator, he didn't use uh, divine providence or supreme judge, which show up in the final paragraph of the Declaration. All of the language for a divine figure came in from Congress when it edited the Declaration. It changed about 25% um, of the wording in the Declaration. So what happened with that language, though, is super interesting. None of the language for religion in the Declaration is connected to any specific theology or doctrine. So it's wide open for people with a very ranging set of views to hang on to. And in addition to that, the language just depends 
not only on language with religious connotations, but also on language with secular connotations. The first sentence of the Declaration, when it starts out, refers to the basis of the argument as being the laws of nature and nature's God. And that, I like to think of as a sort of belt and suspenders phrase, okay? When you're asking the question, well, well what's the grounding for the, the statements of principle in the Declaration? The answer is the laws of nature and nature's God. And so if you are a person of faith, you might hold on to the phrase nature's God. If you are a deist or a theist or even an atheist, as we're present in Continental Congress, you'll hold on to the laws of nature phrase, the notion that an account of human nature, an anthropological picture of what we are all like um, across society space, the, the element that we share despite different contexts, justifies the argument that human beings need rights and protection of their rights in order to have empowerment and a path to human flourishing. You can rest the argument of the Declaration either on a foundation of faith or on a foundation of a commitment to a picture of human nature where human beings need protection of rights in order to flourish. Belt and suspenders. That was a compromise. When they wrote the text with vocabulary that permitted a huge range of people with different kinds of views about God and religion all to endorse the Declaration. Now, the other compromise is about enslavement. This will come as no surprise. Exactly the same kinds of debates that transpired in the, Con in the Constitutional Convention transpired in 1776 in Continental Congress as they were drafting the Declaration. And they had the same arguments about representation and how to count people and so forth. So the decisions that get encoded in the Constitutional Convention have actually been predetermined in 1776. And you get a kind of past dependency situation where they've compromised on how to count things and they can't undo that compromise by the time they get to 1787. But where does the compromise show up in this text? There's an anti-slavery moment in the text and a pro-slavery moment. The pro-slavery moment comes in a paragraph that Jefferson wrote and that his committee endorsed, but that Congress cut out. And this was a paragraph in the draft of the Declaration condemning the, the slave trade, the inexorable commerce, he wrote. And he condemned the slave trade because he described it as a violation of the sacred rights of life and liberty of people in Africa. In other words, Jefferson used exactly the same vocabulary of sacred rights of life and liberty for Africans as he was using for people in colonial America. All right? And this is the passage that Congress cut out. That was a pro-slavery moment um, when they got rid of that passage. So what was the anti-slavery moment? The anti-slavery moment shows up in this paragraph. And it is the phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By this point in 1776, philosophers had become accustomed to arguing for a rights-based political system in the vocabulary of life, liberty, and property. Right? So what happened to property? Where did it go? Why did we get happiness? There were really two people who were driving the politics leading, leading to independence. John Adams from Massachusetts, whom I mentioned, and Richard Henry Lee from Virginia. Adams never owned slaves. He thought slavery was a bad thing. Richard Henry Lee from Virginia was in the slave owning um, caste. Massachusetts was well ahead of Virginia in being ready to go for revolution. The reason the Virginians finally decided to join the course joined the cause and commit to independence came in the fall of 1775. What happened was the, the royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, issued a proclamation declaring that any enslaved person who escaped and fought for the British would be free. Right? That proclamation radicalized the Virginians. It inspired them to join the cause of revolution. So that's one of the hard, sad facts of American history, that the thing that generated union, brought the colonies all together, finally ready to fight for independence, was actually, in the case of Virginia, threat to the system of slavery. Right? That's just a fact we have to acknowledge honestly. So what happened when the Lord Dunmore issued this proclamation, so the Virginians began complaining that he had violated their rights of property by affecting slavery in this way. And so from the fall of 1775 through the spring of 1776, 
the concept of right to property and slavery became very closely linked to each other. Benjamin Franklin commented on this fact in the debates on the Articles of Confederation, where the term property was again causing problems in the debate because of its close linkage to a defense of slavery. At the same time that property was acquiring this connection to slavery, John Adams is really trying to answer the question of what new kind of society should they build, presuming that they decided to embrace revolution and independence. And he publishes a text in January in Massachusetts where he outlines what he thinks will be necessary, and it has the structure of the Declaration, and it uses lots of the same vocabulary of the Declaration. And then he publishes a pamphlet in April called Some Thoughts Concerning Government, where he argues that the purpose of government is exactly the same as the purpose of the individual human being. And that fundamental purpose, he says, is happiness. John Adams is the person who, for those months leading up to June and July, is arguing that happiness should be the concept that they use to organize a set of shared values that will motivate the revolution. All right? So and we can see the debate unfolding and working in the sense that when George Mason comes to write the Virginia Declaration of Rights in May of 1776, he uses both the property and the happiness concept. He talks about a set of, li of rights that involve acquiring and securing property and pursuing happiness. So we can see them sort of trying to work on compromise language here. The property term has become problematic. Happiness is starting to emerge as a possibility. And then when we get here, it's happiness, the anti-slavery position. Obviously, happiness is a capacious term, capacious enough that those who were defending enslavement could see themselves still as potentially represented in this language. Nonetheless, for the abolitionists, it was a clear signal. And the first people to make use of the Declaration for purposes other than revolution were abolitionists. So in January of 1777, a free African American in Boston named Prince Hall uses language from the Declaration of Independence to submit a petition to the Massachusetts Assembly for the end of slavery in Massachusetts. And this language repeats itself in the Massachusetts Constitution and also in constitutions in Vermont, Pennsylvania, all three of which get rid of slavery by 1783, so before the Constitutional Convention. So this text, this language, helped crystallize, coalesce the abolitionist movement to bring slavery to an end for real in a portion of the newly United States. So that pursuit of happiness is the anti-slavery moment in the Declaration. So that's the second compromise, okay? So I said two compromises, one good and one bad. Both compromises helped them achieve union, the union they believed was necessary to fight the British. From a pragmatic sense, they defended the compromise on slavery as being motivated, in essence, by fear. That they had put their lives on their line, they were traitors, they had no choice but to compromise on this question, otherwise they would all die, basically, in their inability to fight England without being unified. So that was sort of pragmatic kind of argumentation that they gave. But we, from our vantage point, have the luxury of being able to make a judgment and to say, well, what do we think about these compromises? Were they equally good? And I think they weren't. I think the compromise around religion was a good compromise, and the compromise around enslavement was a bad compromise. But what's the basis for that judgment? How can we tell the difference between a good compromise and a bad compromise? The compromise around religion, importantly, incorporated the viewpoints of all the different modes of religious experience then present in the colonies. Believers of a variety of kinds, and there were some like wild sects, you know, acting and active in the colonies, really very sort of um, unusual and extreme kind of theological viewpoints, and they were incorporated in this language, and there were people who weren't believers at all, and there were deists. The colonies had a range of opinions and perspectives about religion, all of them are incorporated in this compromise. It makes itself available and accessible to each of those potential viewpoints. Enslavement is a different matter. Right? That compromise did not include the viewpoints and perspectives of all affected. And it's very obvious how not. It did not include the viewpoints or perspectives of enslaved people. And so there you have it, a very simple principle for being able to identify the difference between good compromises and bad compromises. Good compromises rest on a foundation of inclusion, of in fact 
seeking to ascertain the viewpoint of all affected by the relevant decision as a part of testing the quality of the compromise. Bad compromises are those that fail to bring in the viewpoints of all affected in the consideration of the structure of the decision. So we don't have to take from our history the lesson that all compromises are bad compromises. We can actually take the time to look at different compromises made at different points in our history and ascertain which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. But why have I been going on so much about compromise? Why is it so important? I want to say one more thing about that before turning um, to the end of my reflections on um, the mistakes they made and how we can recuperate them. So democracy depends on self-governing people coming together to make decisions together. People lose in every political contest. Somebody loses. So if a democracy is going to work, it has to be worth it for the people who lose in any given moment to continue to participate. Right? So in other words, over time, the political institutions have to deliver broadly for everybody. And they have to function in a united way for that to work, for that to happen. Because if they don't work over time for everybody, those who are losing out will secede. And we've been through that. We know what that looks like. They will break away. But if the losing party secedes, all you have is a principle for the end of democracy, right? Because you have one group who secedes, you've got a remnant that's left, and then you'll have a, another group that loses out, and then they'll secede, and eventually democracy will break down. In other words, the biggest threat to democracy is the kind of division that leads people to opt out, all right? Because democracy cannot survive that process of fragmentation. It can survive only if people commit to the political institutions as valuable in themselves for the kinds of empowerment they provide to us. And we can commit to that only if we also commit to maintaining their union over time, their existence over time. So compromise is one of the tools that's necessary in order to establish and maintain the principle of union for political institutions that makes democracy a long-term possibility, not just a short-term temporary possibility. Okay, now that was a pretty abstract argument. I'm happy to talk more about that in Q&A if you want me to clarify or elucidate. But I just want to say why compromise is so important. It's because you can't actually maintain democracy over the long term unless you can maintain union. And you can't maintain union unless you have compromise. That's the basic point. All right, so here we are trying to figure out how to use the declaration today. And I hope I have shown you, first, a very clear picture of what citizenship is, what is entailed, laying the foundation on principle, and understanding how to organize the powers of government. I hope I have secondly shown you that the Declaration belongs to all Americans, and wasn't just the text of Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner, it was also the text of John Adams, somebody who didn't own slaves. It was also the text used by abolitionists right at the very beginning of this country's founding. In other words, this country has always had multiple political traditions, and the Declaration belongs just as much to abolitionists as it may have done for a very brief window to slave owners. They didn't stick with it because they repudiated it when it came to the Confederacy. They wrote an alternative that said explicitly, no, people are not equal, and we have to set our government up on that new footing, okay? So slave owners repudiated this declaration, as it happens. But the point is that sometimes we sort of dispense with the entirety of our traditions and patrimony on the grounds that the founding of the country had as a part of it the compromise over slavery. But there were people right from the beginning fighting slavery, and this text was actually a part of what helped them do that. So I hope you've given, given you that as another element of recuperating this text for the present. But so here's the third thing, and it's really about the work that is in front of all of us. This is my, my last um, point. So in addition to issues around slavery, lots of people always ask, well, what about the word men? Where are women? What does it mean that this language is sort of focused seems to be focused on males. And there's an easy answer to this question, and then there's a more interesting answer to the question. The easy answer to the question is that the word men was used at this point in time in a universal way to mean human beings generally. And we know that because in that same passage I described, that sort of cut out about slavery, 
Jefferson describes and criticizes markets where men, in all caps, he writes it, are bought and sold. Okay, so he's talking about slave auctions. And we know when he talks about men being bought and sold, that he doesn't just mean males. He doesn't just mean adults. He means women and children, everybody. So we know in that passage that he used men in a universal way. And he used it this way here as well. But here's the more interesting and more complicated thing. So Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife, was super excited about revolution. And she was sort of like chivying John along. She kept saying, what's taking you guys so long? Why, why haven't you gotten to declaring independence? And as they were starting to articulate principles, she also came back to him and said, what about the ladies? Where are the ladies in this? Remember the ladies is her famous phrase. And she complains that she doesn't see any advance for women um, in the language that they're using to articulate their principles. And John writes back to her and says, well, yes, actually you're here. You're, the rights of life, the pursuit of happiness, he doesn't use that phrase exactly, but he uses the same kind of language. The this goal is to deliver that for everybody, for women as well as for men. He writes similarly to a fellow politician who's asking about people without property and Negroes, and the same thing sort of language is, yes, that those, these principles, the foundation of principles, applies to everybody. Everybody deserves to have their rights of life and liberty protected. But, but, when it comes to how we organize the powers of government, he says, we are not going to, in his phrase, give up our masculine system, okay? So it's this very distinction at the bottom that explains how they were able to make the mistake that they made. They could lay the foundation on a principle of universal rights for all, but nonetheless think it was possible to organize the powers of government based on a masculine system, sort of patriarchal structure of male property holders, white male property holders, controlling power, and make the case that that would be a way which they could deliver on rights for everybody. Now, Abigail wrote back and she said, okay, but the truth is, husbands don't have a very good track record over history in their use of power in relationship to their wives. So we'll give you one more chance, but you better do better this time. And if you don't, you should be aware that women will foment rebellion, was her phrase, for voice and representation, okay? And at that moment, Abigail is making a philosophical contribution to the development of our understanding of democracy. She's making the point that if you actually want to protect rights for everybody, you can't put how power in the hands of a few. They will inevitably abuse it. So she's actually adding a principle of inclusion in how we organize the powers of government as a necessary foundation for achieving genuine democracy. And indeed, her prediction was borne out. Suffragettes fomented for voice and representation. We're now all in the midst of celebrating 100 years of voting rights for women. Um, and Abigail articulated the philosophical principle at stake there. And it was basically to make the point that if you're going to organize the powers of government in order to deliver rights for everybody, you have to organize the powers of government to include everybody in the allocation of power. All right? And so we have been working through that question of how to reorganize power in an inclusive fashion for a very long time at this point. We are still working on it. But I want to just call out the distinction between the principles and how we organize the powers of government as a way of seeing what the work still is for us as we seek to correct mistakes, philosophical mistakes that they made at the founding. So the text is relevant. It can guide us, give us lessons, but also charges us with responsibilities and jobs to do for ourselves in 2019 that nobody prior to us could possibly have done. So in that regard, it should be an empowering document, not one that in some sense puts the dead hand of history on us, but rather one that elevates us and asks us to think anew and for ourselves on how to deliver for all of us in this country the picture of empowerment to which it draws our attention. Thank you very much.
looks like there's a mic for students. So you put your hand up then I guess the mic will come around to you. Uh, hi, Professor Allen. Uh, just a quick question. You say uh, the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are self-evident. However, what's not mentioned in there is the precise form of government that best secures those liberties. So it's not self-evident that democracy is the best possible way, best possible form. So how exactly do you arrive at the conclusion that democracy is the best way to secure these rights? So the relevant self-evidence is lodged in the structure of the entire sentence. So it's not the, the premise about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is actually not the self-evident bit. So the sentence has five clauses. It's taken together that they constitute self-evidence, right? So they are that all men are created equal, and then there's a specification of that. That means equal in the sense of being endowed by the creator with certain rights, and here are some examples. So premise one, human beings have rights. Premise two, governments are instituted among men to secure those rights. That delivers a self-evident conclusion that it's the right of the people to alter or to abolish their government. That right of the people is a democratic right. It's in the final conclusion that you get the argument about democracy. The notion that it's the job of the people to lay the foundation and organize the powers of government to deliver on their safety and happiness. The people may decide on a variety of kinds of form for organizing their government, but at the end of the day, Sovereign power rests with the people, and that's a fundamentally democratic principle, regardless of what kinds of institutional structures you sit on top of that. Hi, how are you? Thank you for coming out here. Um, I wanted to ask a question in regards to um, something that actually appears in the bottom of the Declaration of Independence. As this is, you know, talking about equality, I think it's uh, worth noting, you know, the status of Native Americans at this time, there is a passage within the Declaration of Independence which notes how um, the British government and King George were motivating um, the Native Americans of the West, or what was quoted as the pe people who were quoted in the Declaration as being both merciless Indian savages, um, uh, who were like, you know, going through the land. but. I thought it was um, a bit confusing because um, doing some of my own research on Thomas Jefferson, it seemed as though he happened to be very, you know, seemed to go be pretty forward thinking in terms of like American, Indi uh, American Indians or Native Americans. I don't know what your preference is here in the room, but you know, I guess Native Americans works. Um, cataloging, you know, Native American languages and stating in his writings that Native Americans and white Americans should be seen as equals. So I. I don't know if this is maybe an edit, maybe one of the members of Congress made, or if this was the wording of Thomas Jefferson, but either way, um, how do you think we should look at it from uh, either perspective, and what would you say uh, the Declaration holds in terms of you know, ideas like treaty rights and stuff like that? Thank you, that's a super important question. So um, I pointed to compromises around enslavement in the Declaration, and I did that in order to show that there were diversity of opinions around slavery at the point of the writing of the Declaration, and they were contesting that. It is not the case that you can say the same thing, really, about how the Colonial Americans and Continental Congress were thinking about Native Americans. So there is no counterbalancing moment in the Declaration to the language about merciless Indian savages. Um, and it, it, we have to recognize, from my point of view, that the founding of the country does rest on genocide of Native Americans in addition to resting on enslavement. And there is really nothing, I think, that you can say positively about that passage. Um, so I think one has to be honest about it's that, that fact that it's there. So for example, sometimes if I'm in participating in an event where people are reading the Declaration out loud, people will pr pr propose that we not read that line. And I think that's actually not the right thing to do, because again, I think we have to be honest about our history. So my goal is always to be honest um, without slipping into cynicism um, and to be appreciative of the good things that the founding did achieve, but without falling into sort of deification of founding because there were wrongs done and there were people who knew better. So um, Jefferson is an extremely complicated figure and full of contradictions of all kinds. Um, but you know, at any point in history, there is always actually somebody who's articulating an alternative moral position. 
Um, and so I think another thing we should avoid is the view that they just sort of never knew any better. Um, there, it may, you know, not many people may have been articulating an alternative moral um, viewpoint, but it existed. Um, so I think we have to talk about that honestly. Um, I'll add one last thing there, which is to say, um, I, when I talk about equality in the Declaration, one of the things I'm trying to do, one of the things I'm trying to do is sort of show people how freedom and equality belong together. Um, and the kind of equality that I'm really emphasizing and talking about in the Declaration is political equality. Um, so you can't achieve uh, freedom, the sort of space for every given person to have a sphere of agency, unless that sphere of agency includes being able to steer the collective polity together. And so you need political equality for that, and for all to be free, everybody needs access to that, which is another aspect of equality. Even though, however, I focus on political equality, it's also the case that the American founding had a huge emphasis on economic egalitarianism. And that shows up, for example, in Thomas Jefferson's work to get rid of primogenitor, so to change inheritance uh, so that states wouldn't just consolidate in the sort of firstborn and develop aristocratic estates over time. The goal was to kind of keep breaking up inheritance so that you would have lots of kind of middling estates. And Thomas Paine proposed that everybody, when they turned 18, should get a kind of allocation of funding to help them get their start in life. Um, and one of the most um, kind of radical versions of this was the land lottery in Georgia where um, they gave out land to sort of equal sized allocations by lottery um, to men, women, and children, white men, um, widows, and orphans. Um, but the, where did that land come from? It came from expropriation from Native Americans. And so as I see it, one of our current challenges is to figure out, once again, how to help steer our economy in egalitarian directions. Um, that's not the same thing as saying socialism. Okay, well, I mean, you could absolutely be committed to egalitarian directions in your economy without necessarily having to be committed to socialism. Socialism is one way of thinking about that. That's not the only way. You could also have market-oriented approaches to an egalitarian economy. But the job is to figure out how to do that without expropriating from anybody. Um, and that's an example of how you can, we can learn from the mistakes they made. They understood they needed an egalitarian economic foundation to support a democratic republic, um, but they made the mistake of resting that on ex expropriation. Uh, during our class, we discussed a lot the difference between altering the government or abolishing it. I wonder, like, with your close reading, do you think they have any suggestions of like where the bright line should be between changing government or abolishing it? So it's that's a great question, and it's a hugely important one. And you probably noticed when I was talking talking about. probably noticed when I was talking about the job of being a citizen that I didn't I didn't focus on ab abolishing, right? I just focused on altering, the fact that we have work to do to alter things. Um, and they are very explicit, actually, right? Because immediately after this sentence, they say that governments should not be changed for light and transient causes. And then they make the case that the history of the present king of Great Britain is a long history of usurpations. And so and then they're very careful to spell out the way in which they've been working for a long period of time across multiple dimensions and receiving no response from the king. So in other words, the sort of capsule lesson that they articulate at any rate is that you have to have make a concentrated effort over a long period of time and be making no progress uh, before you could put on the table the prospect of completely uh, sort of overturning existing structures and trying something new. So in general, um, when I think about the state of our political institutions and things we might do to uh, make Congress more functional. I talk about increasing the size of the House or introducing ranked choice voting in con congressional elections and other kinds of elections or in, in achieving the sort of spread across all 50 states of independent, nonpartisan redistricting commissions. These are changes that would be transformative for our political system. And it cannot be said that collectively as an entire society, we've put all our will into making them sort of over an extended period of time and come up short. So I feel like there is plenty of room um, for us all to be engaged in a project of alteration, working together with shared purpose and uh, will.
Well, if you know you're going to ask, I have three. <laughs> three questions, oh man. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm hot. Duck and cover. <laughs> yeah, I'm hot. Um, so for, first of all, uh, I love the idea of uh, happiness as a dog whistle for abolitionists. Mm. Um, and I wanted to ask if... It was uh, more than a dog whistle. It was like right out there. Yeah, well, so the question is, because uh, it's Aristotelian, so I wanted to ask mm -hmm. if there's any evidence that this comes from uh, Adams' reflection or influence by, by Aristotle. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what yes, yeah. I mean, so I think some thoughts on government um, absolutely it dips into Aristotle, it dips into a variety of theological traditions as well. Um, and yes, it, that it is um, a eudaimonistic conception, a human flourishing conception of happiness. Terrific. Uh, uh, <laughs> putting it in the bank. Um, the other is, uh, I, I wonder if maybe you've separated uh, principles and organizing organizational powers a little too much, because isn't it the case that for them, uh, the argument, because you see this in the Federalist Papers, that the arguments for separation of powers, checks and balances, sort of follow very closely upon the notion of sovereignty of the people and the notion that they're instituting liberalism, they're instituting limited government, that, that they need to form in a certain way so as to protect uh, those rights. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, so I wouldn't. Um, the, the two have to be completely connected to each other. I mean, you organize the powers of government in order to deliver on the foundations and principle that you've committed to. So, absolutely, they go together. But I think it's important to see the pieces of work as analytically distinct. And um, I would just let me give you one more piece of evidence for how they thought them as analytically distinct. I mean, so one piece of evidence was just the fact that they set up these separate committees to do the different parts of the work, to write the statement of principle on the one hand, and then to organize the powers of government. And when it comes to the Constitutional Convention, um, 1787, the Committee on Detail, one of the members of that is James Wilson, who is a very much um, under-acknowledged um, leader, really, of the Constitutional Convention. He had the same level of influence as Madison and was esteemed by his colleagues in the same way for his learning and his insight into political philosophy, basically. Wilson had signed the Declaration um, and then participated in the Constitutional Convention and he spends the years from 1783 up until the convention making the case that the original founding, that the whole thing rested on the Declaration of Independence. And indeed, at the convention, he reads the Declaration of Independence out loud. And then the Committee on Detail takes the time to ask the question of whether or not, so the Committee on Detail was this moment where um, they've gotten to a point in the convention where it's clear that they can't, in the committee as a whole, you know, with all the sort of 50 plus of them, you know, actually draft the thing. They have to assign it to about five people to do the actual drafting. And so that small committee, uh, one of the first things Wilson does is ask whether or not they need to write a new statement of principle, um, or is the job just to rewrite the you know, instrument organizing the powers of government. And they decided you do not need to write a new statement of principle. Their job is just to rearticulate how to organize the powers of government. And then subsequently in the ratification uh, conventions for Pennsylvania, Wilson was a delegate from Pennsylvania. Um, as he had done in the convention, he stands up um, there in Philadelphia and reads this sentence out or recites this sentence. And then he says, I actually wrote this down so I want to share it tonight. This is the broad basis on which our independence was placed. On this same certain and solid foundation, this system is erected. Okay, about this sentence, he said this. So the draft, draft of the Constitution. So the point being that they recognized the work on principle done in this text as its own kind of work, and recognized the work with the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution as an analytically distinct kind of work, inseparably linked to each other, right? In the languages, this is the broad basis on which <laughs> this instrument rests, right? So totally linked, but analytically distinct. And I just want people to take that away because we just don't really spend enough time thinking about our principles. And we've gotten used to a public life where, oh, I don't know if I've seen a principle in a spell, you know? It's not so pretty out there. And they set a really high standard for the kind of thought we should all be bringing to our democratic life. And that's what I really want people to sort of see and take away. Great, and uh, number three is just, uh, isn't the, the value of including the, the position of the enslaved people on their slavery really dependent on the on the prudential question of what would have happened if they hadn't cut out that paragraph. Because I'm thinking you can include that anti-slavery moment of, of Jefferson's in his uh, complaint about the, the execrable trade in, in slavery. 
But if the result is that the, the, the southern states don't join and the, the union is not achieved, wouldn't you end up with a worse situation, less chance, less possibility of, of eventual uh, emancipation? See, this is one of those things we were talking about this earlier today. And these are those kind of impossible hypotheticals because the truth of the matter is we do know one thing you would have ended up with, which is Canada. Okay? Because there had been no revolution. That's what it looks like. You know, Canada is what it looks like when there was no revolution. Um, and Canada did not have the same kind of difficulty. So in other words, the North would probably have looked like Canada, and then who knows exactly what would have happened in the South. That would have been a different kind of question and picture. So um, there's no question but that they thought it was pragmatically necessary for the sake of union to make a compromise amongst themselves, Northern whites, Southern whites, and to ignore the interests of enslaved people. But I think that's the kind of hypothetical we can't actually answer in the sense that it would have been a much harder thing, without any doubt, to achieve moral consensus at that point in time on the wrong, the fundamental wrong of enslavement, and to have refused to build a society on that basis. But what if they tried? We don't actually know what that would look like. We really don't. There's no way to say what that would actually have looked like. Therefore, there's actually no way we can assess would things have changed faster or slower um, if they had not made this pragmatic decision. First, I want to thank you for an excellent close reading. I really appreciate it. My question is sort of outside the text and inspired by the title of the book from which this is from, Our Declaration. And in my experience of the Declaration today, teaching young people for 25 years, is uh, I, I, I find that they find the Declaration both to be a dead dogma in that they think they know everything about it already. Um, and at the same time, they have fundamentally contradictory ideas about the principles. And so on the one hand, if you ask them, should all people who have never hurt anybody else have the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and do you believe in human rights, they all say yes. And then if you ask them, do you think that these uh, are true rights, that somehow exist beyond our subjective preferences, they get extremely uncomfortable. I, many will just say, no, they're not true, they don't believe in truth, they're not comfortable with the language of truth. And others will say, well, it's my truth, but I would never say it's anybody else's truth or it should be forced on anybody else. And so we, we have a generation that's uncom fundamentally uncomfortable with principle. So I have two questions. One, do you find, is that your experience with students? And two, what do you do about it? Do I do about it? <laughs> um, so thank you, that's a really important question. Um, so I do have that experience. Um, I do have that experience. And yes, you're right, um, that we do have a, not just a generation, but I think a broader society, in all honesty, that has lost its grip on the concept of truth. Um, so I suppose what I do is I articulate my own position in relationship to that question um, and talk about it with students. My own position on that question is that, yes, um, I take there to be truth, and I take it that it is my job as a thinking person to seek the truth, but I also take it that it's my job as a, seek, as a thinking person to do that with humility and with an expectation that I am fallible so that the best I will ever be able to do is to make fallibilistic judgments about what I take to be the truth. And so that's the sense in which we do have to debate with each other, absolutely. It's not going to be the case that I'm going to stand up and say, I know the truth, it's been revealed to me in some perfect way that can never be questioned, um, but I will always tell you that I have made my best judgment, I will provide my evidence and my arguments for it, I will absolutely convey that I recognize my own fallibility and I will ask you to show me my mistakes. And I try to exhibit that over and over again in my classroom and to win students over by helping them see the value of a commitment to truth. The fact that the rest of our um, standards um, of ethics and moral commitment to each other actually depend in the first instance on our commitment to truthfulness as a character trait. Does it work? Um, well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I've, I've never, that's a good question. I hope it works. I hope it works. I mean, in my experience, I find, um, 
I don't, over time, have any difficulty talking to my students about principles, so I find myself quite able to engage my students in arguments and debates about principles. So I suppose in that sense it must work because they, did, they do participate with me um, in these discussions. Hi, I really appreciated yeah. your um, lecture. It was very interesting. Um, my question is, how do we know that people are fundamentally created equal? You know, it's pretty easy to say that like it's a truth and that it's self-evident. Um, but in which ways are we supposed to see the like fundamental equality that they you know ascribe, or do we have to just take it from like a natural rights sort of perspective and just assert it and then just have that be the end of the discussion? So thank you, that's a great question. Um, so I just spent a little bit more time on the concept of self-evidence here. And um, this might be slightly, you know, slightly annoying because I'm very technical about it, right? Which is not what people want. We're so used to um, giving the kind of concept of self-evidence almost a kind of mystical significance. Um, and that is really not um, how it's working here. So um, philosophers uh, talk about syllogisms as a way of structuring arguments where the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. And the traditional example is that human beings are mortal. Uh, Bill Gates is a human being. Bill Gates will die, okay? Which is interesting because we so lionize Bill Gates and we kind of like forget that he's gonna die just like the rest of us. He's no different from the rest of us in that regard. But the point is that the conclusion is a logical, is logically entailed by the premises. That's what self-evident means, all right? So what, what self-evidence is referring to here is the structure of an assertion of premises about human beings have rights, an assertion about governments being instituted to secure rights, and then the conclusion that follows from that is the relationship among these truths, which is the relationship of self-evidence. Now that leaves your question on the table, which is where do those first two premises come from, the one about human beings being equal and having rights, and human beings instituting government. And that first premise, there are two different ways that you can see it is coming. So one way that is offered here is the view that a divine picture, people are created, and in being created, there's a certain equality. But there's another way of seeing that too, which is the one that you get to through concepts sort of nature's laws from the previous sentence, which is simply that you look around the world, and over time, everywhere across societies, every day, day in and day out, human beings are trying to have a tomorrow that's better than yesterday. And it's that effort that human beings make, that act of agency, that we all share. That's it. That's the whole story of human equality. And the question is, once we recognize that about human beings, and that is a thing that we recognize through observation, it's an empirical claim about human beings as a kind, as a creature, as a species kind, a thing that we share, is that engine of agency as we seek to build a path to something better tomorrow than we had yesterday. So then there's a question about, well given that about human beings, what's the right thing to have happen for human beings? And the thought there is basically, if human beings all have this kernel of agency, and that agency is directed towards this improvement of experience for oneself or towards flourishing, then in order to make good on that, to let that achieve what it can achieve, human beings need a structure of freedom and participation in collective institutions. That is, it's not enough to have personal freedom if you're subject to a set of social constraints that you had no role in helping to create. If you're going to be the agent charting your own path, you need freedom protected both through individual rights but also through the rights to participate, public autonomy, political participation, and so forth. So you get from a basic observation about human beings and that kernel of agency, human moral equality, to a subsequent argument about the need for political equality to recognize and make good on uh, that basic kernel of human moral equality. I hope that helps. I know it's not a complete answer. Yours was a deep question. So. I have a shallower <laughs> um, later on in the declaration, there's a litany of charges against the king, and I'd like to know whether you think that litany of charges sheds any light on what the founders thought of as high crimes and misdemeanors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All righty. <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, so I think everything that's in that litany is basically also in the Constitution, in effect, implicitly. Um, so let me just try to say what's in the grievances, and then let's see if I can connect that as an answer to your question. So the, gr the grievances are structured in a beautiful way, where there's first a set that are complaints about legislative functions, and then a set of complaints about judicial functions, and then a set of complaints about executive functions. So the grievances are actually structured to lay out the sort of kinds of three branches of power and to set some standards for what you should expect in the operations of each of those branches. And you get quite a beautiful picture of what counts as good governance um, from the inversion um, of the grievances. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I think you can extract um, from all those sets of grievances particular examples of things that counted as high crimes and misdemeanors on the part of King George. Um, what they come down to fundamentally is whether or not the kind of key elements of a structure that secure rights are being undermined, okay? And so I think that's basically the question. If we're considering the president's actions, the question is whether or not the president's actions um, undermine any of the key institutional structure that guarantees and secures rights. So if he takes a constitutional oath of office to faithfully execute the laws and defend the Constitution, and in so doing, that commitment is to that institutional structure that guarantees rights. So that's the question. Um, once one is clear about what the president's actions have been, um, have they, in fact, worked to fundamentally undermine the structure of institutions that protects our rights? That's the question. So in the long form argument of our declaration, you develop this theory of democratic writing. And I was so moved by that section of the book because it thinks about how folks are getting together to try to learn things about questions that they don't have answers to. And that writing, democratic writing, involves people thinking through questions, doing research, doing the actual work of, of inscription and then listening to correspondence um, from, from other folks in the conversation. And it struck me as a pretty tight analogy for what we might be trying to do at a university classroom, even if we're not talking about political theory. And so I wondered if you could talk with us about some of the dispositions that the founders had to their own questions that helped them to come to these conclusions, these principal conclusions, or are there, by contrast, examples of dispositions they had to their own questions that were not so helpful? Hmm. That's a super interesting question. Thank you. Um, so, let me think about that for a second. I, I mean, there is something that they did that I've always had trouble articulating. So it's a thing I can do, but I have trouble describing it. Um, and it is to accept the idea that you go into a conversation not knowing what the answer will be, but having agreed on a question, and believing that the people participating in the conversation will collectively achieve an answer by the end of the conversation that no individual coming in could have predicted. Does that make sense? And to have faith in the value of that process. And the reason I have faith in the value of that process is because each of us has a partial view, can't see everything, and so we will get better answers if we can actually pool our intellectual resources with others. So there's that kind of like faith in pooling of our intellectual resources and openness to the unpredictability of the answer, or the surprise of the answer. Now let's give you one tiny little example of a place where I've you know, sort of recently um, experienced this or sort of felt the power of it. So I'm part of a kind of large consortium of people trying to, we sort of got a grant from the NEH and the Department of Education to develop a kind of roadmap for civic education for the country. And it's a terrific group and it's cross ideological or transpartisan or multipartisan or whatever you want to call it when you're like getting people from a lot of different perspectives. And some of you will know, and I think one of the questions earlier came from a place of, there's a debate in this country about whether or not we're a democracy or a republic. Like, which word are we actually? 
I think that's a red herring of a debate. The founders used both terms. Hamilton described this as a representative democracy in the same years and time that Madison used the vocabulary of republic. So I think it's just a complete red herring, frankly, to have that argument. The result of thinking that it's a red herring is I've been going around referring to what we are as democratic republic, which doesn't sound very good. Like nobody really likes that one, and it kind of conjures up all kinds of like failed states and things like that that have gone by the same label. So anyway, in this civic education consortium, you know, the first thing you have to do is figure out what you're actually trying to do. Like, what are we educating for? And like, is it democracy? Is it a republic? Is it a democratic republic? What is it? And you get really stuck on that kind of question. And so what has emerged out of our conversation? Well, we're working on the education you need for a constitutional democracy. Yeah, that's right. That works. That was a solution. So I got a long-standing slightly weird, if you ask me, debate about our very vocabulary for describing who and what we are. And we only got there because we had a shared question and we're willing to engage in a process where we didn't know what the answer would be before we started the conversation. Just a small aside on the question of their habits. Um, one interesting thing is in the Constitutional Convention, when they justify secrecy early on, it's because they're afraid that people will be entrenched in the positions they identify themselves with early on. Yeah, um, that's a great and point. So, yeah, so it's the ability to change your mind actually requires discipline and structure yeah. rather exactly. than being a natural instinct. Absolutely, no, that's absolutely, and protection, the space of confidentiality. And in fact, there's a lot of good research at this point that um, lots of our kind of sunlight laws and sort of the mega transparency around Congress is a good is one of the causes of our dysfunction. That it's so hard for Congress people to actually have off record confidential conversations where they can take a chance, where they can have something be unpredictable, where it's not like a message to send out, but they can't function any longer. So I think that's something that we have real thought to. I also want to just. Um, Thank you for reminding me. Cite Benjamin Franklin, because it's another sort of aspect of this ethos, where at the very end of the Constitutional Convention, he says basically, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend I think this thing is perfect, though whether there could be a more perfect thing, neither do I have any confidence in that. But here end my agreements. I am going to bury all of my reservations, all my other opinions, and I am going to sign on and endorse this, and the world will never know which parts of this um, I was less enthusiastic about. And so that's another piece of it, being willing to sacrifice your kind of, you know, the completion of your own personal set of opinions and commitments for the sake of the thing that the group has developed together. So there's a, a growing sentiment, I think, in the economics profession definitely existed in political theory going back, I guess, to Plato, but there's a sentiment that people don't know what's right for them. George Akerlof and Robert Schiller wrote a great book on the subject. Um, so I just wonder, how dangerous is that sentiment to these principles? Uh, well, I always say economists don't know what's good for people, so. <laughs> That's mutual. They might think that about me, but I think that about them. So, yeah, no, I think it's super dangerous. And actually, I would say that that point of view from the point of view of economists is um, a, another part of the explanation for why we are where we are currently in our political world. So we've given far too much authority to economists and have failed to... Um, invite them in their policy making to integrate um, the perspective of ordinary people um, on their policy proposals. So I, mean, I have a, a piece that came out in, in the Atlantic yesterday and a long stretch of it is about this actually. But I was just really struck um, in 2016 by hearing more than once from economist friends who said things like um, about globalization. Well, we knew it would cause a sort of 20 year dislocation in the economy, but I never thought about what 20 years feels like in the life of one person. And that's a really important way of capturing the mistake economists make, which is that they're thinking in the macro, thinking in aggregate terms, um, they're thinking in you know, sort of measures like GDP and so forth, or average income, et cetera, um, and not actually understanding what transformation in a particular life looks like. 
So I think the work of um, Agnes Deaton and Anne Case recently, which has focused on deaths of despair, the sort of increase in suicides and things like that, particularly in working class um, populations without high school degrees, um, is, is a starting point for economists to kind of reacquire the ability to figure out what life looks like from the point of view of people actually living um, and the effects of policy. Um, and I think there's been just too much of a disconnect between how economists have approached policy and the kinds of knowledge that comes from lived experience in communities going through transformation. And we really need to rebuild that connection. So economics is valuable if it can partner with the people. I know you're an econ major, so sorry if I, you know. <laughs> My question is in regards to the phrase, whenever any form of government becomes destructive, because I find that the term destructive is quite arbitrary and is open to several different interpretations. So what do we as a society do when half of us believe that the government is very destructive while the other half believe that we're living in a golden age? Yeah, no, that's a hugely important um, question and I think there are uh, multiple parts of the answer to that. So um, I think any healthy democracy depends on a virtuous circle um, of mutual influence between a healthy political culture and civil society and healthy political institutions. And so it can be tempting when we think about polarization and so forth to say, well, we need more conversations with each other or we need more stability or something like that or we need this kind of attitude towards group writing that we were just talking about. I think we do need that, but I think there's no point asking for that if you have political institutions that are structuring incentives in ways that work towards polarization and towards division, and we do. So I think you actually have to reform political institutions at the same time that you're trying to rebuild a culture where people reach out across lines of difference to have the kinds of shared values conversations I was describing. And let me just give you one very concrete example of what I mean about that reform. I've mentioned this already, but I'm a big advocate of ranked choice voting, which is when you go into an election and you don't just vote for your first choice, but you vote for your second and your third and your fourth as well. And so then if your first choice is one of the low vote getters, your votes drop out and your vote goes to your second choice person. And the result of that is that winners will be people who have actual majorities, not pluralities for starters, but more importantly, and there is empirical evidence um, to support this, People campaign differently in ranked choice elections. And the reason for this is because you want to be somebody, it's not just their first choice, but you want to be somebody's second choice and third choice too. So there's no point demonizing your opponents. And so ranked choice voting starts to generate a kind of political ecosystem where people are campaigning more to the middle in more moderate ways and in more positive ways, less demonizing of opponents and so forth. So I think there are actually institutional changes that could help us have incentive structures that would support a healthier culture. And then we can all like engage in those healthy cultural practices of reaching out across divides and expect it genuinely to get some traction and make a difference and start making forward progress. So we have to do both of those things together, I think. I think there's time for one last question. So it should be somebody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet. I'm not sure if that's okay. Hi there, uh, thank you once again for coming. Um, I wanted to specifically ask you about your concerns with, you know, division. I just read actually your essay in the Atlantic, which I appreciated. It was very good. Um, but I was wondering how much of this is kind of uh, perhaps a nostalgia for a historical period, right? Like post-war America was a unique time in which the end, you know, of literally wartime nationalism under FDR, uh, the threat of, of communism, many other factors of like how the press operated at the time, created like a really unique and frankly a historical low partisanship era, right? Like this was not how normally America has functioned. And it seems to me we are increasingly moving away from that time period for, for many reasons. So I'm just curious to some degree, I agree we need these institutions in a democracy to work and legislation to pass. But to the broader question of like, will people suddenly start becoming friendly to one another um, in terms of partisanship identity, I'm curious if you think uh, that that's so simple, given that uh, with the exception really of the post-war era and those unique conditions, American partisanship has been pretty bitter. I mean, in like, I think the 19, 
10 census, like the Republicans literally just didn't conduct the census because it would give more, to, more votes basically to the cities that immigrants had moved into, so they just didn't conduct one for 10 years. Um, that's like one example that comes to mind of just how often this has been the case in playing hardball. So I'm curious in your thoughts. Yeah, no, I appreciate um, those good questions. Um, so it's not nostalgia in my case. I think there are versions of the argument that absolutely are nostalgic, but um, it's just, it's basically not possible, I don't think. I shouldn't make such a broad claim. I would find it highly surprising, actually, for any African American, in all honesty, to be able to offer a nostalgic point of view. Um, so post-war was also Emmett Till. Post-war was when my dad, you know, left the South, and you know, the story I grew up with was I left the South because I was tired of feeling like when somebody could jump out from behind a tree and shout, get that nigger. So I can say that word, I know everybody else can't, so I apologize for that kind of inequity in access to vocabulary, but that is a story I grew up with, and so it's a story I have to tell to be true to my own history. So at any rate, it's not nostalgic, um, but um, so then the question is, um, is it realistic, given that we have a country that is built on contestation and conflict, and not just the partisan conflict, but also race conflict, as I just pointed to, and in fact, there is a way in which you could look at our current division and polarization and say, that's success. That means everybody's voice is finally in the public sphere. Like, we're hearing everybody, that's why it's so noisy, right? You think, whoa, like, we're moving in the right direction, actually. And I think there's some truth to that, in fact, that we actually have to recognize contestation and as actually like success. Like We've got people's voices in the public sphere. So in that regard, I actually feel like I'm trying to set the marker further out. And I, think, I feel like what I'm trying to do is set the marker on a place where we can genuinely build a multiracial democracy. Where for me, the stress is as much on the word democracy as on the word multiracial. And I think we spend a lot of time kind of talking about the multiracial or multicultural part, but we don't spend enough time talking about the democracy part. And that's what I'm trying to get us to spend more time on, basically. So thank you, it was a really fantastic question.